started. We are recording. All right, so to uh, kick off or flag off this uh, workshop today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Leniger. Alex is a postdoc researcher in the Computer Vision Lab at ETH Zurich. And he's working on the Toyota research for automated cars in Europe as one of the flagship projects during his postdoc. Before this, he was a PhD student uh, in the Automatic Control Lab at ETH Zurich as well, where he obtained his PhD in 2018. And Alex is doing research in the area of autonomous driving, which includes end-to-end -end policy learning, uh, safe decision-making, and motion planning for handling vehicles at the limits, which brings us to this uh, very uh, exciting title of pushing the limits of friction. So Alex, it's over to you. and. Um, yeah, whenever you're ready, 20 minutes. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, yeah, or give me the opportunity to talk in today's workshop on autonomous racing. Um, yeah, I will talk about pushing the limits of friction, a story of model mismatch. And this is really joint work between uh, a lot of labs like Computer Vision Lab, the Automatic Control Lab, and the Institute for Dynamic Systems. And then finally, kind of the AM set, the Formula student team. So what I want to talk to you about today is kind of how to design motion planning and control strategy uh, with which we can push uh, autonomous race cars to the limit. And for this, uh, I will focus on model predictive control. It's a very fle flexible and efficient method, and it works very well for this task. In fact, I'm using it for nearly now 10 years for autonomous racing. Um, but for model predictive control, one thing is, which is very important is the model. Uh, so the model has to be simple enough such that we can handle it from a computational perspective, but then it should also be accurate as otherwise the prediction we make are not good enough, especially if you want to push uh, to the limit. So um, that really uh, accurate model is fundamental. I learned very early on. So in around 2012, 2013, we got really our model predictive contouring controller working at ETH. And this is kind of the first video uh, we made public. Uh, and you can see the car is driving good, but occasionally it hits the walls. And sometimes the line it takes, I would not consider as very optimal. Now, over kind of the next few years, I learned a lot on how to identify cars, how to perform better experiments for identification, you know, improved everything on the whole setup. And uh, the result with, you know, exactly the same controller, exactly the same model structure, just better parameters for uh, the tires and the motor model resulted in uh, this behavior, where you can see the car is driving much smoother. It's quicker. Actually, I think we are close to a second quicker per lap, which is massive, just by changing slightly the model parameters. So now to show you that this kind of model mismatch or having a good model is not only important for these tiny cars, uh, here a video of a full-scale car from uh, AMZ, the Formula student team in, at ETH. And this is really uh, the experimental platform I will focus to for the rest of the talk. And uh, I hope you can see that uh, once the car really starts to accelerate, um, because the car tires are cold, uh, the model is not good enough and the car starts to spin out and crashes. Okay, so let's take maybe a step back and look at our kind of control or motion planning framework. So at the beginning, we always have kind of a mapping run. This is really necessary because in uh, Formula Student, tracks are built up by cones on the side. So you need to first out find out how is the track even look, how does the track even look like. For uh, the miniature race cars, this is simpler. But for this talk, what we basically need to have is we need to know how the track looks like. This then brings us to our actual kind of control stuff, which is first we run an offline phase where we compute the reference path. This can be the center line in a simple way, uh, but I would su suggest to you know compute uh, um, an optimal race line offline. This can be done with uh, lap time optimization tools. Uh, we use them successfully, but also uh, minimum curvature paths work well. And then basically we come into the online phase. Um, this is really the focus and what I will talk about in uh, this talk. 
So there, first, we need a state estimate. This we do by running a slam pipeline, which gives us position and heading, and then a velocity estimation pipeline, which gives us the longitudinal lateral and uh, the yaw rate. Now, given this state, we run our MPC controller, which finds a path that follows our reference path or ideal line. And then uh, as done in MPC, we take the first input, send this to basically the car uh, and repeat this. Now the car in our case has actually a low level controller. I mean, for example, imagine a steering rack, uh, you know, there still needs to be a motor which moves the wheels to the exact steering angle we demanded. In this talk, we will, I will really mainly talk about the MPC and then at the end a bit about the low level controllers. So how do we formulate our MPCs? Um, I would generally, I would describe our MPC controller as kind of progress maximizing path following MPCs. It's a mouthful, I know, but it kind of explains both our popular approaches, which is the MPCC approach, model predictive from Turing control and MPC curve like a curvy linear uh, MPC formulation. And uh, what they both try to do is they both try to follow a reference line while maximizing the progress. Uh, we formalized this MPC problem using standard MPC techniques. So we use kind of a, a fourth order Runge Kutta discretization for the model. And then uh, we can translate this nonlinear uh, optimal control problem into a nonlinear optimization problem which we then solve using sequential quadratic programming or nonlinear uh, interior point methods. And, you know, in this case, just that, you know, we speak about kind of prediction horizon of roughly two seconds into the future. So how is the MPC problem built up? So the cost function really has two parts. One is the progress rate maximization. This pushes the car to drive as fast as possible. And the second part are kind of regularizers. So we want to follow the path. We don't want to go crazy with the inputs. And for us, it turned out that kind of don't have too high side slip angles uh, was also a very effective regularizer for our car. Just, you know, don't tell it to please don't drift. Um, okay, then the second part is really the model. So our prediction should of course start at our state estimate. And then we can basically make prediction with our um, dynamic bicycle model, which I will talk more about. And then finally, we have input and state constraints. So <clears throat> we want that the car stays within the road. We want that uh, the friction ellipse uh, of each tire is not exceeded such that you know, the car can really achieve what we demand. And finally, we have some input constraints like steering angle and maybe also, you know, kind of rate constraints on our steering actuators. They cannot do whatever we demand. Okay, so the most important part, especially for this talk on model mismatch is the model. So how does the model work? It's a dynamic, it's a bicycle model. So we just have two tires, um, but it's a dynamic model. So uh, the force laws of the tires are modeled with um, magic formulas, uh, but check off tire models. So really, the, uh, you know, we consider the saturation of the tires and the force loss, the how much force we demand from the motor and the steering angle are defining how the velocities evolve over time. And then kind of now a few tricks to make this in a nice MPC problem is first, we don't use the steering angle and the driving command is T directly as input, but we kind of lift them. So we demand how much they should change. This allows us to um, optimize for smooth inputs and also uh, allows us to you know, limit the rate with which they change, which is very important for a steering system, which you cannot demand infinitely fast changes to. Now, the big difference between MPCC and kind of the curvy linear systems is really just in how we represent our position. In the curvy linear system, uh, we represent it in a Rene frame and a curvy linear frame, where we have both the state, uh, kind of the progress state, which describes where we are along a path, and then the, um, how far we are off the path with n and kind of the local heading with respect to this path. Now, in the MPC, C, so the contour control formulation, 
this is a bit more cumbersome. We describe it as a global position and the global heading, but because we still want to do the same thing, we still want to follow the path, we somehow need to recover the same quantities. And we do this by adding auxiliary variables and then you know, adding everything into the cost, which makes it, uh, you know, it would make a full talk just explaining the MPCC um, cost function. But I hope I can just uh, convince you that at the end, what we just want to describe with the MP with this formulation is just, you know, the progress along the path and kind of the deviation to the path which we need for a path following controller. So the two formulations are really very similar. And at least from a model predict from a model mismatch standpoint, they are the same because the model mismatch really happens in the velocity states, which are identical for the two models. Okay, so what is model mismatch? Model mismatch is really the difference between what we predict will happen and then what the car does in reality. So um, this error is very easy to compute. That's why I like it. Uh, we have a lot of historical data. We can learn online from it. So we can compute the error online and so on. So it has a, nice, a lot of nice property. And now what you normally try to do is uh, you try to minimize this model mismatch as it would you allow to make better predictions. And I will now show you two approaches to do this or introduce quickly two approaches to do this. One is kind of based on learning to correct the model using Gaussian processes. And the second one is kind of making the car behave more like the model. So they are kind of the opposite uh, in how they work. Um, here, this is really uh, kind of a very interesting topic in my opinion. And uh, over the years, I also tried other approaches as more complex vehicle models or directly using the historical data in a randomized stochastic MPC framework. But today I will focus on these two. So let's start with the learning based method. So here, the idea is really that, you know, we have a physical model of the car and that's actually, this model is already very good. So uh, why, so the idea is really use it and then just use a Gaussian process to learn the difference between what the car really did and what the physical model uh, predicted. For the Gaussian process to learn this, we use kind of five features. Uh, the three velocities, the longitudinal velocity, lateral velocity, yaw rate, but then also the steering angle and kind of the uh, throttle position, what the driver commanded. And based on that, the GP then predicts uh, the error in the three velocities. So, um, uh, yeah, in, in fact, we actually don't use exactly the steering angle, but somehow the midpoint uh, of the steering angle and the throttle. But this is an implementation detail, but an important one. That's why I wanted to highlight it here. Okay, so once we have such a Gaussian process, how can we use it? Um, and it's quite simple. We can use it in two ways. First, we can use the mean prediction to correct the model constraint in the MPC. So we really include the Gaussian process in the MPC. And that's also the reason why we need a sparse Gaussian process, as otherwise it would not be tractable. And then finally, we can also use the variance to do kind of constraint tightening uh, of our constraints. Okay, so how do we add? Uh, oh, no, the, the last part now that we know how to use it is how to kind of learn the Gaussian process. So the Gaussian process is a non parametric technique, so it explicitly requires data points to make a prediction. Um, however, this also limits how much data you can use. In our case, uh, we were able to use about 400 data points to make a prediction. So it becomes very important to correctly select the data points you use, uh, especially if you learn it online. And we use kind of a variance information measure. So if we have two data points, uh, we will add uh, the data point, which is kind of reduces the variance more to our Gaussian process. Now, here, just a bit of a warning. If you do something like this, be careful about um, outlier removal as kind of outliers are extremely informative and can completely destroy your Gaussian process. Okay, so let's see how this works. So here you can see the car driving. Uh, for the first two laps, we actually didn't use any um, model correction. We first wanted to 
build up a nice dictionary of data points before we turn it on. Uh, and here you can see the drivable area in red and then the prediction horizon uh, in white. And I don't know if you can see it, the green floating points around, these are the location uh, of the data points we collected. Okay, so I told you for the first two lab, we just run the nominal controller and then we turned on uh, the model correction. Um, and the difference is immediately noticeable, like the lab times immediately decrease and we can even reduce it from 20 to 18 seconds. And even if you look at how the car drives, um, which hopefully it starts, yeah, um, you can see an immediate difference. Um, so the car drives much more aggressive. Um, and what's also nice is that um, now the prediction horizon is not just a line, it is actually kind of a we also know about the uncertainty of our prediction, which allows us to you know, take safe uh, actions, even if we push that hard. Okay, so uh, in summary, we were able to reduce the lap time by 12%, which is massive. Um, and while the nominal model started to be kind of more and you know, the, the, the model error of the nominal model increased once we pushed harder, uh, the model error of our corrected model basically remained constant, even though we started to, you know, drive significant, significantly faster and also uh, increase the lateral acceleration significantly. Okay, so what I showed you until now, the idea was really to make the MPC model more accurate to the real reality. And now in the remainder, I will show you how we can do the opposite and kind of make the real car beh behave more like the MPC by using the low level controller. And this is really possible because these cars have um, in the four independent wheel uh, motors. So we can do extremely nice low level control stuff. But first, let me show somehow how, did it, how does it work without the nice stuff. So there, um, the MPC, would generate kind of the driver command and the steering angle. This is really meant to replicate what the driver gives uh, the low level steering as uh, the low level control setting. Now, the steering system is very simple. That's just PID control, which tracks the steering. The, the torque side or the accelerate, the, lo uh, the, the longitudinal dynamics is a bit more complicated, but what we do there is kind of the torque or the demanded driver command kind of gets mapped to a torque which then gets distributed to all four wheels based on the um, normal loads uh, of the current driving situation. And then finally, we also add some torque vectoring to it. So this basically made to, this makes the car behave more neutral. And this is really the idea that uh, the car behaves more like uh, easier to predict for a human driver. But you know, we, don't, we are not a human driver. We don't speak about human drivers anymore we speak about autonomous cars. So how can we make this better? And the first idea is that we actually extract part of the solution from the MPC. So not just take input, but extract some solutions. So we take the longitudinal acceleration, which we can recover from the solution, the yaw rate we can recover, and then also kind of the future trajectory of the steering angle by kind of a steering angle and acceleration reference. Now, this allows us to basically define a better steering controller. Um, and then kind of the main additions are on the kind of the yaw rate and acceleration side, where we now run an acceleration control, which reduces the model mismatch on the longitudinal dynamics. But the nice part is we can also uh, correct for the yaw rate by the, uh, by the torque vectoring. So uh, we can just, if the car yaws less than we predicted, we can use the torque vectoring to instantly correct for these errors. Okay, um, now this has also the nice side effect that we can now in the MPC problem optimize over the torque vectoring, which gives us even more uh, kind of command, you know, even more performance. And what I really like about this method is that it kind of gives a holistic approach from, you know, our lap time optimization down to our low level controller, everything is nicely coupled. So um, now let's see the last video. Um, where we can see the car now drive with this new controller. Um, and I hope you can see that the, co the controller pushes the car, I mean, really hard. So uh, you can even see it slide through corners. Um, and 
yeah <laughs> i don't know what you can see to be honest the video looks pretty bad on my side at least um so uh the final thing we did we also compared it to a human driver um and so this is really one of the most experienced driver for formula student uh so really the one they use for all their competitions um and yeah he's actually quite fast i have to say so but the nice part is that uh what we achieved is kind of uh to get i mean actually even slightly beating this driver uh so we achieved better uh, a better best lap time and also a slightly better uh, average lap time now this comparison is not fair as the MPC has a limiter on the top speed. It cannot use the hydraulic brake. But then on the other side, the uh, the car is 70 kilo lighter because there is no driver. So even though we kind of are slightly faster, we never say that we can kind of beat the driver. But at least um, I think we are really close now to competing with human drivers. And this we can also see at the Chi Chi diagram where you can really see that we that the autonomous system in blue really uses all the kind of, uh, you know, all the grip the car has. And just to kind of give some ind indication, the green one is the last year's solution, 2019 solution. And this is, I would say, roughly as fast as a good normal driver with no prior experience in single seaters. And then the, the red one is, you know, a, a person with a lot of experience in single seater driving. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, I hope I could highlight the importance of model mismatch for autonomous racing, and I proposed two kind of dual approaches to solve the problem. And both of them achieved kind of lateral acceleration of over 2G, which I think there are very few approaches which achieve that if there is even another one. And with one of them, we uh, were even able to kind of rival or match the performance of a human driver. Now, future work, I think it's quite obvious it's combining these two approaches to get the best of both worlds, but unfortunately it's not so trivial. Um, yeah, and with this, uh, I would like to thank uh, for the attention and also thank all my collaborators. So from AMZ, from academia, and really the AMZ team, without them, this would have never been possible. Thanks. All right, Alex, thank you, that was great. Um, and yeah, uh, just for, for all our panelists, if you have videos, there's an option in Zoom when you share your screen, which says optimize my screen for videos. And that yeah. usually helps with the with the frame rate. But we could tell we could tell your car is fast. So don't worry. <laughs> Otherwise, the videos are all on YouTube. <laughs> so yeah. go there. Uh, they're all on the AM set YouTube channel. Um, they are kind of nice view anyhow. So. <laughs>